is thought to be responsible for shutting down star formation in massive galaxies. Um, AGN outflows could also potentially trigger star formation in a dense interstellar medium. Um, so these black holes play an important role in the evolution of galaxies. Along with the first uh, stars and galaxies, accreting black holes in the earlier universe also likely contributed to reionization when the hydrogen in the universe went from being neutral um, after the recombination era to being largely ionized. These massive black holes can also rip stars apart that happen to wander too close by. Um, these tidal disruption events can reveal otherwise quiescent black holes in distant galaxies, and they can also teach us about the formation of accretion disks around massive black holes. And then finally, merging black holes uh, are sources of gravitational waves. So we've seen some spectacular results coming out of LIGO in the past few years, um, where people are detecting gravitational waves from the merger of two stellar mass black holes and neutron stars now. Um, in the future, other gravitational wave experiments like ESA are expected to detect the mergers of more massive black holes that are in galaxies, and eventually we will get these mergers because galaxies merge. Okay, so hopefully you now understand, if you didn't already, why supermassive black holes are really important uh, and relevant to many different areas of astrophysics. But the origin of these supermassive black holes is largely unknown, and we still don't really have a complete, clear picture of the subsequent evolution uh, of massive black holes in the host galaxies. So here are some open questions that um, drive much of my research. Um, so first of all, uh, how did the initial seeds of supermassive black holes form? How massive were they initially? What types of galaxies did they form in? Um, did galaxies and their nuclear black holes grow synchronously over time, or does one grow first and then the other one catch up? Um, and finally, how do black holes um, impact their host galaxy through feedback, and then how are they fed? Okay, so what do we know? One thing we know um, is that the first black hole seeds likely formed within just a few hundred million years after the Big Bang, so very early on. And this is because we can actually observe billion solar mass black holes that are lit up as uh, luminous quasars um, at very, very early times when the universe was less than a new year old. So this has to provide some constraints for any model um, of seed formation and subsequent growth. Whatever you start out with, you have to be able to reproduce these massive uh, black holes at early times. Okay, so there are a couple uh, theories for how the first black hole seeds may have formed. I'm just gonna give you sort of the two extremes. Um, so one idea is that the black hole seeds formed from the first generation of massive stars. Okay, so at the end of their very short lifetimes, these massive stars would explode uh, as core collapse supernovae um, and leave black hole remnants with masses on the order of tens to hundreds of solar masses. Okay, and if this is how seeds were produced, it's expected that they would be pretty abundant in the early universe, be, you know, with most early um, low mass galaxies hosting at least one of these. Alternatively, uh, black hole seeds may have been significantly more massive, uh, formed from the rapid inflow and direct collapse of uh, very dense gas in the early universe, leaving black hole seeds with masses uh, on the order of maybe 10 to the 5 solar masses. And the appeal of these more massive seeds uh, is that they help ease the problem of assembling these billion solar mass black holes in the very early universe. Uh, but it's also thought that special conditions are necessary to make these more massive seeds um, because you have to somehow prevent the gas from fragmenting and making stars. Um, so there are ideas for how you can do this, but in general, it's expected that these massive seeds would be relatively rare um, and pretty scarce at high redshifts. Um, in other words, it's expected that these massive black hole seeds would have had a low occupation fraction in early low mass galaxies. Okay, 
um, it would be great if we could just go and observe early universe black holes, um, but it's kind of hard to do that because directly observing uh, the first C black holes um, is basically not feasible right now. Uh, the black holes that are detected in these very high redshift quasars are already quite hefty. They have typical masses of maybe 10 to the 8 to 10 to the 9 solar masses. We'd really like to know about the lower mass black holes, the C black holes, uh, in the earlier universe. So people have looked um, for AGN signatures in high redshift galaxy surveys. So you actually you start with where you know the galaxies are, high redshift galaxies, for example, in a Hubble field. You go look for X-ray signatures there, and people aren't finding anything. They're, they're, they're not detected, um, even in our deepest X-ray observations. So we can't, at least right now, observe these C black holes at high redshift. Fortunately, present day dwarf galaxies with low masses offer us another avenue to learn about the origin of black hole seeds. Um, they can offer us clues to the origin of supermassive black holes. Okay, so this um, is a collage. It can sort of give you an idea of the relative sizes of galaxies and what I mean by a dwarf galaxy. So the large galaxy um, in the center is meant to represent the Milky Way. Um, and I'm going to be talking about looking for massive black holes in little dwarf galaxies like these uh, with the circles around them. So the basic idea is that searching for the smallest black holes in today's dwarf galaxies and studying their properties um, really places the most concrete limits on the mass of black hole seeds. Okay? These studies can also tell us uh, what galaxy characteristics favor the creation of a massive black hole in the first place. And by comparing observational results uh, to models of black hole and galaxy growth, we can even learn about the formation mechanism of black hole seeds. So I think this sort of sums up why this works. Uh, in general, we know that bigger galaxies have bigger black holes. So if you want to learn something about black hole origins, it makes sense uh, to look in low mass galaxies, okay? Unlike today's massive galaxies uh, with black holes that have grown substantially through accretion and mergers, these dwarf galaxies have, expect, have um, experienced relatively quiet merger histories and they're expected to host black holes that are relatively pristine. So we think they're pretty close to their original seed masses. And it turns out that if you uh, consider models of black hole and galaxy growth in a cosmological context, starting with different seeding scenarios, the observational signatures indicative of seed formation are strongest in today's dwarf galaxies. So the two primary diagnostics um, are shown here. So we have the black hole occupation fraction on the left. This is simply the fraction of galaxies of a certain mass that host a black hole at all. Um, and then other diagnostics include black hole uh, galaxy scaling relations at low masses. So you can see things look different in the low mass end. Um, on the flip side, at high galaxy masses, or velocity dispersions, whatever you want to consider here, the black hole occupation fraction is going to be equal to 1 for both of these models, right? Think back to the simulation that I showed earlier. Regardless of how you start out your initial black hole seeds, the hierarchical buildup of massive galaxies ensures that they're all going to host uh, a black hole today. Okay, and this is also what we know from observations from Chicago, for example. Um, likewise, the black hole host galaxy relations are indistinguishable for these um, different seeding scenarios at the high mass end. But if you look at the low mass end, these two models look very different, right? Because these galaxies have sort of quietly coasted through. Uh, cosmic time without undergoing too many mergers or getting assembled into a massive galaxy. Therefore, they sort of retain some sort of memory for the initial black hole seeding conditions. Do you have a question? Yeah, how low mass is the low mass end? So, right, I guess I covered up the, <laughs> the numbers. Um, this is roughly like 10 to the 9 solar masses, 10 to the 8, 10 to the 9. So, LMC, SMC kind of masses. And you probably need stellar mass. Stellar mass, yeah. Um, okay, so if a large fraction of early galaxies were seeded with black holes formed 
from the first generation of stars. We would expect a relatively <coughs> large fraction of dwarfs today to host massive black holes, whereas if they were formed in this uh, kind of exotic direct collapse scenario, we would expect a very low occupation fraction in dwarfs today. Um, and the predictions for the scaling relations are also different um, due to the relatively ungrown black holes at low masses. Okay, so there is clear motivation for searching for and studying massive black holes in nearby dwarf galaxies. This is currently our best observational probe of the origin of black hole seeds. Okay, so that's the motivation, but what about reality? So until recently, um, very few dwarf galaxies had any observational evidence for hosting massive black holes. So their existence was very controversial. Um, essentially, all of the black holes that were discovered were, were hosted by giant, massive galaxies, okay? And when I was in grad school, I learned that all massive, bulge-dominated galaxies have supermassive black holes, not the dwarfs. That was standard lore not too long ago. Um, but hopefully, as I'll come into this talk, um, over the past several years, um, my work has really helped transform this field. We've gone from just a couple of examples to large, systematically assembled samples demonstrating that massive black holes uh, in dwarf galaxies are much more common than was previously thought. And if you want to see kind of the state of the field, at least up until 2016, you can see this review paper here. Okay, so how do we go about detecting these black holes? I'm guessing this group already knows a lot of this, but I'll try to go through at least briefly. So before the EHT, the most secure method for discovering a black hole was to track the orbits of individual stars and use Kepler's law, okay, to weigh the central black hole. So this um, is just an animation of the orbits of stars at the center of our own galaxy um, over a time span of about 15 years. And so using these data, astronomers determined that there's a black hole at the center of the Milky Way with a mass of about four million solar masses. Okay. This method is great, but it can really only be used in the Milky Way because you can't resolve individual stars um, in more distant galaxies. So the next best thing is to um, perform dynamical modeling uh, of ensembles of stars or to model a circular rotating thin gas disk. Um, so this is uh, what Janelle does. Uh, but in order to uh, use these dynamical methods, you have to be able to probe the very inner region of the galaxy where the stellar or gas motions are being dominated by the gravity of the black hole. Okay? So you have to spatially resolve the black hole's sphere of influence in order to do this. Um, and this can only be done for relatively nearby systems with current telescopes. So I think today there's something on the order of 100 galaxies with dynamical mass measurements. But very few are in dwarf galaxies, okay? There are a couple of detections, a few upper limits as shown here, but currently this uh, approach is really limiting because the gravitational sphere of influence for a small black hole in a low mass galaxy can't be resolved um, beyond roughly the local group, okay? So it's really hard to do this uh, in dwarf galaxies. So really, we're kind of forced to search for black holes that are shining as AGNs, okay? And so here's a schematic of an AGN showing different possible components. Um, you have your black hole engine surrounded by a hot accretion disk. Sometimes you see a jet. Um, there can be gas clouds uh, close to the black hole in what's called the broadline region or further out in the narrowline region. You also have dust in some cases, right? So there's all these different components, and they produce various types of radiation at multiple wavelengths, okay? So you get x-rays coming from plasma very close to the black hole. Uh, the accretion disk produces a thermal spectrum, peaks in the ultraviolet. The ionized gas clouds uh, in the broad and narrow line regions give you these telltale emission lines uh, that we use primarily at optical wavelengths. You can get dust, and then infrared, okay, and then jets can produce uh, synchrotron emission that you can pick up in the radio. So we have lots of uh, tools or observational signatures that we can look for to try to identify a black hole in a galaxy, or specifically a dwarf galaxy. 
So for the remainder of the talk, I'm going to tell you about two main searches that I've undertaken. Um, one of them is at optical wavelengths, and the other one, more recently, is using uh, radio wavelengths, and that's resulted in some pretty exciting, unexpected results. So I'm going to start with the optical. Um, and so this was done using spectroscopy from uh, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. This really produced uh, the largest sample of dwarf galaxies hosting massive black holes. It was the first systematic search for AGNs and dwarf galaxies. Um, and so to do this, I analyzed the spectra of about 25,000 dwarf emission line galaxies in the SDSS. Uh, and all of these galaxies had stellar masses less than three times 10 to the nine, so LMC kind of mass. Um, right, and this is just showing that. So this mass threshold of three times 10 to the nine, um, I sort of pit as what I'm calling a dwarf galaxy because that is the mass of the LMC, which is the most massive dwarf satellite of the Milky Way. Um, right, so I use Sloan, which covers a lot of the sky. Okay, so the SDSS provides imaging in five broadband filters um, spanning the optical wavelength range. Um, and so from these imaging data, um, we can combine with the spectra, we can estimate things like the stellar masses of the galaxies, uh, the sizes, and general properties of the galaxies, colors, etc. cetera. Um, but the really useful part is the spectroscopy. So the SDSS obtained optical spectra of a few million objects. Okay, and this is just an example spectrum of the nuclear region of a galaxy. So you can see there is continuum emission. Okay, in this case, it's dominated by just stars in the galaxy, but there are also these emission lines from ionized gas. And what's nice is the properties of these lines can tell us what is ionizing the gas. Is the dominant source of ionization young hot stars or an AGN. So this is the kind of data that I analyzed uh, to search for emission line signatures of accreting massive black holes. Okay, so here's an example of an emission line diagnostic diagram that can be used to select galaxies with AGN photoionization signatures. This is the BPT diagram you've probably heard about. Um, and this particular diagram uh, takes the flux ratio of O3 to H beta uh, versus N2 to H alpha. And dependent on the dominant ionizing source, emission line gal galaxies fall in these different sequences. Okay, so star forming galaxies are the, the left branch with lower metallicity systems off to the left. Um, AGN host galaxies generally have higher metallicities. Uh, and a harder ionizing spectrum, which moves them up uh, in O3 to H beta. Um, and you can see by eye in this spectrum here, there is a very high O3 to H beta ratio. So that's the EGN. Um, on this diagram, the dashed line shows an empirical separation between star forming galaxies uh, and objects with an EGN contribution. And the red line shows a theoretical maximum starburst line that comes from photoionization models. Okay, so anything above the red line is really dominated by AGN. Things that fall in between these two lines are called composites, um, and they're thought to have contributions from both star formation and AGN. Okay, um, so basically, I wanted to find dwarf galaxies with emission line ratios falling in either the AGN or the composite part of this diagram. So in addition to looking at those narrow emission lines, I also searched for broad uh, H alpha emission in the spectra because this can actually signify dense gas orbiting very close to the black hole, um, just light days from the black hole in this broad white region. The line width can be hundreds to thousands of kilometers per second uh, due to the Doppler shifted radiation along our line of sight. And for these so-called broad line AGNs, we can use the broadline kinematics to estimate the mass of the black hole. So you have to have the broadlines. You can't do this if you only have the narrow lines. So I'll just briefly go over how you get these masses. Um, so under the assumption that the motion of the broadline emitting gas 
is dominated by the gravity of the black hole, then the black hole just, the mass just goes as r to the square root over g, just gravity. Okay, so we get the average gas velocity from the width of the broad line. And the luminosity of the broad lines, you just add up the flux, multiply by 4 pi d squared, you get the luminosity. You can measure this pretty easily from a single spectrum. We're going to use that as a proxy for the radius. And we can do that based on the radius luminosity relationship that has been determined for a subset of AGMs. I think 70, you're probably more right now. Um, and these AGMs have been monitored over time using a technique called reverberation mapping. And so in this situation, the size of the broad line region is determined from the time lag between variability in the continuum and a broad emission line. Okay, so you can imagine that the continuum flux is coming from the accretion disk, which is very close to the black hole, okay? That's gonna vary in time, AGMs are variable. Okay, these variations get echoed later by changes in the flux of a broad emission line that's coming from ionized gas farther away from the black hole in this broad line region, okay? So there's a delay time uh, between the continuum and the broad line variations, which you can see in this example here. And this gives you basically the light travel time um, across the line region. Here in this example, that delay is about 15 days. You can then multiply by the speed of light, and that basically gives you the radius of the broad line region. Okay, so this, as you can imagine, requires a lot of telescope time. You have to monitor these things. And you can only do this in general with pretty bright AGNs, so you're not going to do it with everything. But for the ones where they have done this, there's this nice relationship between the broadline region radius that they measure using reverberation mapping and the AGN luminosity. Okay? And so we can just use that result for all other broadline AGNs where we might only have a single spectrum. Okay? We can easily measure that luminosity and convert it to a radius. Okay, so in terms of your uh, observables, this is a handy little equation um, to calculate black hole masses. So you really just need the width and the luminosity of this broad H alpha line. To, this is an estimate, right? These are obviously very incorrect <coughs> masses, but it's the best we can do. Okay, so here um, are the main results from this work. Okay, so based on narrow emission line ratios, um, I found 35 AGNs and 101 objects falling in this composite region um, that have contributions from AGN and star formation. So these also likely host massive black holes. Um, I just want to mention that this was a pretty big step forward in this field. Before this study, there were only a few galaxies in this mass range. Uh, found to host massive black holes. Okay, here are just a collection of SDSS images for some of those galaxies in my sample. Um, they span a range in color and morphology, uh, but overall they have pretty general, uh, sorry, pretty regular morphologies. They don't look crazy. Some of them are bluish, some are reddish, some are disky. Um, but it's hard to say a whole lot about these galaxies from the ground-based imaging just because the spatial resolution is not great. Uh, but luckily, we have a telescope in space um, that can get much sharper images. So um, I've obtained HST observations of about, I think it's 40 of these galaxies from my sample. Um, and one of my students, Seth Kimbrell, is currently uh, working on this and writing up the paper um, to try to determine the structures of these galaxies. Do they have bulges? Are they disky? You know, what are these galaxies like? Because these are the least massive galaxies that we know of that host massive black holes. And we want to know how these galaxies hosting these optically selected AGNs compare to the general population of dwarf galaxies. Are these special in some way? And so that's what he's currently writing up. Um, okay, so again, here are all of the dwarf galaxies on the BP diagram. And now on the right here, I'm only showing the broadline AGN candidates, I'm going to call them now. 
um, which will be clear in a moment why. So these are the special ones because we actually can get estimates for the black hole masses. Okay? So 10 of the AGNs and composites uh, have broad A chocolate in their spectrum. And then additionally, we have these galaxies with narrow line ratios falling in the star forming part of the BPT diagram um, that also have broad H alpha emission. And that's why I'm calling them candidates for now. Okay, so here are the distribution of black hole masses using that technique I described before for just the broad line objects. And I've separated things into things that I consider to be secure um, and less secure, the star forming things. So the 10 objects that have narrow line ratios in the composite or AGM part of the diagram are shown in this orange histogram here. So these have lots of evidence for AGNs. Um, and they have really small black hole masses. The median black hole mass for these is just two times 10 to the five. Um, collectively, these are the smallest black holes that we know of in the galaxy nuclei. Um, there's been some new results coming out recently, but in general, we're, the limit is roughly 10 to the 5. There are some pushing down a little bit below 10 to the 5. And what's really exciting is that some of these, these masses overlap with some of the masses predicted for seed formation models. So we're really pushing down into this interesting regime. And just to remind you, for reference, the black hole in the center of the Milky Way is 4 times 10 to the 6, and the largest black holes that are being found are in the order of 10 to the 10. Okay, so these are teeny tiny compared can I ask you a quick question? Yeah. So if you go back to that re relationship between, I think it's the radius and the velocity, and there was a scatter, and there was an equation you wrote down. Yeah, that equation. Um, and there's presumably like scatter yeah. in that relationship that comes from. Uh, yeah. And is the, the scatter like that you model it right now, is that just from, say, your, your measurement uncertainties, or is there like an intrinsic scatter component no, there the, that you can the estimate? the largest amount of uncertainty comes from the relationship. So if you include all of the relationships that go into this equation, uh -huh. the uncertainties and the masses are probably half a dex. And that, that, that comes like not from, um, that comes from essentially the quick model, if you will, and not the... It's not the fitting. Yeah, not yeah the no, fitting. the fitting is not the issue. The, the issue is, sorry. Actually, so can this, you flash that figure? We'll get, that yeah, 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 so it, this has an, right, there's scattering here that goes okay. into that, and then there's also, so the original relationships were based on H beta, uh -huh. but Jenny, a long time ago, showed how you can go from H beta to H alpha. So I basically used a similar technique, but with an updated radius luminosity relationship from okay. SD. Yeah, I guess maybe yeah. like another question is like, and this might be kind of a too general a question, you know, we can have to start towards the end if we want, but uh, like, is the mat, is the relationship like, so you're measuring these masses peak at like 10 to the five solar masses for black holes, is, is there like a caliber, are those relations like calibrated for black holes at this scale? So the for the radius luminosity relationship, there are a couple low mass systems. So NGC okay. forty three ninety five okay. has has it, which okay. is a similar mass to, okay. to these guys. Yeah. But so the mass, so that's the radius luminosity. But if you're asking about the mass, it is calibrated okay. to because you have to okay. ship. You need to oh, the mass. Right, yeah. right. So okay, in, maybe that's what I'm asking. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So the um, that's in here. So that little epsilon thing, that is the this F factor, but cast in a different way. It depends on whether you use the line dispersion or the full and half max, what the relationship ends up being. In this particular formalism, that term is essentially, it goes away. Epsilon is about one. Okay. So, but yes, overall, the radius luminosity relationship is calibrated to that signal relation. Okay. And it's definitely like F, is, like, there's a huge uncertainty. Right, so if you're using F, it's more like four, I think, rather than epsilon. It just where, where like F is the parameter in front of the twiddle, when you're saying F. Even that, like F would be that twiddle, turn that twiddle. Oh, sorry. It yeah, yeah. Be, yes, it would be. So it's twiddle F times. Epsilon RV squared over G. Okay. Yeah. And that takes into account all the unknown yeah. things, geometry, et cetera. Okay. Um, but the reason, uh, I don't know if this is, I think this is sort of related, but there, we are not sensitive sensitive to black holes much lower than this mass based on the flux limits of the Sloan spectrum. Okay, even if you would like extrapolate relationships down to? Yes, we number. can't, so it's, um, yeah, just because of how, it's a flux limited survey and how low you can go. Um, so, and it also depends on the energy ratios, but yes, in general, we're sensitive to a 10 to the five solar mass black hole at 10% 
So we could do a 10 to the 4 if it was at Eddington, mm -hmm. but those are extremely rare. We don't know if they exist, yeah. <laughs> either in that mass or that, you know. So anyways, there certainly could be smaller black holes, but we're not sensitive to them here. Um, okay, right, so for these 10 objects with narrow line ratios indicating AGM, they were brought H alpha. We also went and got Chandra observations, detected them all in x-rays with luminosities well above what you could explain from star formation. So these are for sure AGMs. Um, we also have new uh, HST observations of these, this nice sample here um, with the broad line uh, sources. And so one of my other students, um, Zach Shetty, just recently wrote a paper on these, um, and he basically was able to break down the structures of these galaxies and estimate bulge masses or pseudo bulges, whatever you want to call them, um, and populate the low mass end of the black hole mass bulge mass relation, which is really important because building up this relationship, particularly particularly at low masses, is important for distinguishing between different seeding scenarios. Um, so that's recently been published. Okay, so coming back to these weird guys in the star forming region, um, I was suspicious of these because they didn't have the narrow line ratios indicating an AGN, but um, they were following, they had broad lines. But the broad lines also tended to be weird. They were really broad, leading to sort of abnormally high black hole masses compared to the ones that we were actually pretty sure about. Um, so it turns out that um, there's a lot of contamination, or basically total contamination from uh, supernovae, type two supernovae. Certain flavors of these can make really broad uh, H alpha emission, but we can see it disappear over time. So we have the Sloan spectra, we go get another spectrum 10 years later, and that broad line has faded. Whereas for the ones in the AGN and composite part, the broad line is still there, as you would expect. So we can rule out supernova um, interlopers this way. But the you want the, narrow line ratios too, that's sort of the main point. If you have narrow line ratios indicating the AGM plus the broad line, I think that's pretty safe. Um, from this SDSS sample, we also um, found one of the smallest central black holes known uh, with a black hole mass estimate of just 50,000 solar masses. Um, and this relatively tiny black hole lives at the center of this galaxy here. So this was originally classified as a composite object in my Sloan sample, but I didn't have any estimate for the black hole mass because that broad H alpha line fell below the detection limit, but we could kind of see this hint, and so we went back and got better spectroscopy with Magellan, and then we had this nice clear detection of this little tiny broad H alpha component, which give us, gives us this black hole mass of um, 50,000 solar masses. So this is probably, at the time it was the record folder, there might be other claims now, um, but this is definitely one of the least massive black holes we know of. Okay, so this optical search uh, for AGNs and dwarfs was quite fruitful. We've had lots of cool follow-up results uh, and have learned some, some more things along the way. Um, but the, these optically selected AGNs are likely just the tip of the iceberg because the selection technique is only sensitive to the most actively accreting black holes, so they can be accreting at a pretty high rate to make these optical signatures. Um, and they, the black holes better be living in the nuclei of the dwarf galaxies because this, that's generally the brightest part. That's where this, based on the selection of Sloan, that's where they're gonna get a spectrum to begin with. And they have to also have relatively low amounts of star formation. Because if you have too much star formation, you can swap out these accretion signatures, okay? So we can certainly pick out ones using this BPT diagram that are almost certainly AGNs, but we might be missing a bunch that are living in this star forming part. They just might not be accreting very much, or there might be so much star formation that you cover up all those signatures. Um, okay, so we really need other diagnostics. Um, and so now I'm gonna kind of tell you about a newer, more exciting, I think, well, I don't know if it's more exciting. It's more exciting because it's new. Um, but we have a, a new search out um, using high resolution radio observations um, and we're planning to get follow-up x-ray observations um, because these radio and x-ray wavelengths can reveal black holes that might be missed um, at optical wavelengths. The, if you have a compact 
radio source and x-ray source coincident um, at the center of a galaxy in general, that's what we think of, this is a, a good indicator of accretion onto a massive black hole. And these telescopes in particular are great because they have high resolution, so you can isolate that compact emission from the rest of the galaxy. And this technique is highlighted by this discovery of a massive black hole in the dwarf starburst galaxy, Canis 210, um, from a number of years ago. This was the first dwarf galaxy I ever worked on for an I was actually studying it for completely different reasons. So this was a serendipitous discovery, um, but it was really aided by the use of high resolution radio observations, and it marked a completely new environment uh, to find a massive black hole. And this discovery is what motivated uh, pretty, uh, yeah, provided much of the motivation to conduct a large scale sur radio survey um, that's led to some really fun results, which I'll tell you about now. Um, and that is the discovery of wandering massive black holes in dwarf galaxies. So this is an artist's illustration of the kinds of objects that we are finding where you have a massive <coughs> black hole not at the center of the galaxy, which is, was completely unexpected. Okay, so for this study, I obtained observations of 111 dwarf galaxies with a very large array in its most extended A configuration, which provides the highest resolution. Um, and I observed these particular dwarf galaxies because they were uh, dwarf galaxies that were previously detected in the first radio survey. So this is a radio survey that covers basically the solar footprint. Um, however, the uh, first has relatively low angular resolution, um, so the origin of the radio emission was unclear. Maybe it could be from massive black holes, but it could also just be from intense star formation in these galaxies. The new VLA observations that I took um, had a much higher angular resolution than the first survey, and they were also much more sensitive. Um, therefore, these new observations had the potential to distinguish between black holes and star formation of the origin of this radio emission. Okay, so out of those uh, 111 galaxies, I detected radio emission in 39 of them. This is just showing postage stamps of the radio sources. Many of the detections were consistent with main point sources. Um, okay, so I detected a bunch of radio sources. It could be, to, uh, could be from uh, accreting massive black holes where we're seeing synchrotron emission from um, a compact jet or the base of a compact jet, that's possible. Uh, however, I, at these not luminosities, I still need to consider alternative origins for the radio emission and try to see if I can rule some of these out. Um, so I consider various possible origins for the compact radio emission, including uh, thermal H2 regions, so just extragalactic star formation regions. Uh, I considered supernova remnants, younger radio supernovae, and also populations of supernova remnants and supernovae, okay? Uh, and then, of course, AGNs, which would signify the presence of a, a massive black hole. Okay, so my analysis demonstrates that AGNs are almost certainly responsible for the compact radio emission in at least 13 of these dwarf galaxies. Um, I think if people want to need to explain these plots later, I can. I can come back to that, but um, this is sort of showing how I rule out some other objects. But I'm getting a little short on time, so ask me the questions if you want me to explain those. <coughs> okay, so here are the 13 dwarf galaxies containing massive black holes. <coughs> so these are optical images um, from the DECAL survey, and the red crosses indicate the position of the radio emission coming from these black holes. And surprise, you can see these black holes are not always at the center of their host galaxy. And this like blew me away. This, I was not expecting this at all. I was very surprised because basically all of the black holes that we had found previously in dwarf galaxies were sitting right in the center. Okay, they were all in the galaxy nuclei. Um, here you can see some of the host galaxies don't even have obvious centers, okay? They, some of them have irregular morphologies. They show signs of interactions or mergers. Um, and so this was very surprising to me just from an observational standpoint because I hadn't seen this before. But recently,
recent simulations actually predict that roughly half of all massive black holes and dwarf galaxies are actually expected to be off-center, kind of wandering around in the outskirts of their host galaxies. Yeah, possibly dumb question, but uh, like for example, the one, uh, let's see, row two, column two, for example, uh, the cross is like, wait, yeah. Yeah. I guess the cross is where the black hole, the radio emission is coming. Yes. So like, do you, you know that's not a background source? So, so uh, I'm going to get to okay, that right. in a little bit. Yeah. So if I don't answer, completely. all right, I'll. Yeah. What are the scales here? Like how offset is offset? Okay. Sorry. So the, do you see the circles? Mm -hmm. Those are the s positions of the Sloan fibers. So those are three arc seconds across. So they're they're offset quite a bit. Yeah. And physical scales. Uh, I don't think I just plot shown, but I think it's it's on the order of a few kiloparsecs. You know, all the way out to five kiloparsecs or so. Okay, so coming back to this illustration, this kind of, I think, nicely portrays what we think is going on here. So these off-center black holes probably result from interactions or mergers between two smaller dwarf galaxies where at least one of those progenitor galaxies had a massive black hole that got flung out during the merger. Okay, so just from dynamical Interactions. Alternatively, it's also possible that um, an off-nuclear black hole could result from being ejected by gravitational radiation recoil um, during the coalescence of two black holes brought in by a dwarf dwarf merger. Okay. But in any case, um, once a black hole leaves a dwarf galaxy nucleus, assuming that's where it was, um, it might not ever return back to the nucleus. Um, and that's why we think these off-center black holes and dwarfs might actually be fairly common. And this is in contrast to more massive galaxies that have giant black holes, they can more easily sink back down to the center through dynamical friction. It's just not as efficient in these dwarfs. Okay, so we also see this trend such that the more extended disturbed later type galaxies, so things off to the right, tend to have more offset radio sources, so going up now, okay? While the more centrally concentrated earlier type galaxies tend to have less, uh, less offset radio sources. In other words, if a galaxy has a regular morphology and a well-defined nucleus, the AGN is sitting right where you would expect it to be. Um, but if the galaxy is more, you know, later type like merger stuff going on, the black hole is further offset. So it kind of supports this idea of black holes being flung out during mergers. Um, and the, basically that's what this plot is showing. So um, you have the radio optical offset versus this thing called inverse concentration index, which is just defined as the ratio um, of the half light radius and the 90% light radius. So another thing that we found is that um, compared to optically selected AGNs, the radio selected AGNs, we're finding them in lower mass and bluer galaxies, okay? And so this is shown in this color mass diagram here. So my parent sample, tens of thousands of dwarf galaxies are these gray dots. So that's where the general population lies, okay? Um, the new radio AGNs are in blue, which you can see sort of follow that, even though they're on a ton of them, they do span that kind of range. In contrast, these optically selected AGNs and composites, which are the red and purple respectively, tend to pile up at the highest masses and in uh, redder galaxies. It's also notable that three of the radio selected AGNs are in galaxies with stellar masses less than the SMC, and that was sort of I think that was the lowest mass galaxy in my optical sample. So we're getting down to really small galaxies. Um, yeah, they are small. The, the half-light radii are on the order of a couple of kiloparsecs. Okay, so this is coming back to the background question. This is part of it. This isn't the full story. Um, we see that the dwarf galaxies with the radius-selected AGNs, so the darker blue ones, tend to have systematically higher ratios of O1 to H alpha relative to other, the other dwarfs in my sample where the radio sources are consistent with star formation, okay? So this 
suggests that the radio AGNs are indeed associated with the galaxies that are producing that line emission. Okay, and so they're prob if the radio sources really are associated with these galaxies, which it seems like they are, that's why you might see this enhanced ratio, which you wouldn't see if they weren't related. You wouldn't see this trend. We also did a more statistical analysis based on our, all of the selections that we made, but I think this is the easiest to explain in a talk. Okay, so the main results from this study um, are that we found wandering massive black holes uh, in these dwarfs significantly offset from the galaxy centers. And this is uh, important in telling us that if we really want a complete census of massive black holes in dwarf galaxies to constrain seed formation, our searches need to account for these black holes that are wandering, that are offset from the centers, where in the past we'd all just been looking in the, in the nuclei, because that's sort of what the data allowed us to do. Um, Finally, this work also, I think, highlights the potential of deep high-resolution radio observations. For example, with the Next Generation VLA, which is something that's being considered now, this could really help us make further progress in our understanding of the demographics of black holes and dwarfs uh, and the mechanism that seeded the first black holes. Okay, so here's my uh, summary slide, just a few main takeaway points. Um, first of all, contrary to conventional wisdom, dwarf galaxies can indeed host massive black holes, okay? Also, this population and properties of black holes and dwarfs can tell us something about the origin of the first black holes in the early universe. Um, we've made a lot of progress in recent years. I told you about this optical search, which uh, vastly increased the number of known dwarf galaxies hosting black holes. It bumped it up by more than an order of magnitude. And then I have this exciting new sample from the radio observations wandering black holes. Um, we are finding the smallest black holes known. Um, yeah, and this is putting our best limits on seed masses. Um, and there's lots of steps in the future. Uh, we have new searches going on, lots of follow-up observations. Hopefully, we'll make progress in understanding how the first seed black holes formed. And then last slide, I have to make a plug for Montana State University. Um, so we have a lot of exciting research going on, um, including gravitational waves, uh, extragalactic and galactic astronomy, and more. We have roughly 70 graduate students, um, lots of young faculty, and we're hiring new faculty, so it's a, lots of fresh blood in the department, people doing exciting stuff. It's a very vibrant department. Uh, and I have to tell you, Bozeman is a fantastic place to live. Um, we have a great downtown with all sorts of cool shops and restaurants and theater and bookstores and all this stuff. We're close to Yellowstone. There's skiing, unlimited hiking, mountain biking, whatever outdoorsy stuff you want to do. So I just say please keep Montana State in mind and encourage any um, upcoming graduate students to apply to our program. Thanks.